you're literally about to be stabbed. Can you please like get your head in the game? Hi there, my name is Catherine. I hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to be doing my April reading wrap up. Went through a bit of a journey in April. It started off really well quite strong and then towards the end of the month I was starting to get into a bit of a reading rut which I'm slowly coming out of now in the beginning of May. I'm literally filming this on the 1st of May and I've got some really exciting books lined up to read this month but I don't know what happened to me. I think I read too many thrillers in one go and got a bit burnt out with the genre but also wanted more of it at the same time. I don't know if that makes sense and there was also one book that came out last month which I was so excited for. It was one of my most anticipated and it didn't live up to what I hoped it would be. But we'll get into that. The first book I read was Hokey Pokey by Kate Mascarenhas. I read this for a video I uploaded last month where I had one of my local bookshops recommend me books to read and that video was so fun. I'm so proud of it. Go check that out if you haven't seen it. And I got recommended some really good books. This book was my least favourite out of the ones I read that they recommended me, but I still gave it three stars. This is a kind of gothic-y, supernatural, paranormal thriller that takes place in 1920s time. You can tell by the cover, it's kind of got Gatsby vibes. It takes place primarily in this one hotel called the Regent Hotel and follows our protagonist, Nora, who is a psychoanalyst who has gone to the Regent Hotel because she's followed a woman there that she's spying on. She's trying to catch her in the act of cheating so that her husband has proof. It's split up into three parts if I'm remembering rightly and the middle part actually doesn't take place in the hotel. You go back into Nora's past to find out what her childhood is like. Oh my goodness, <laughs> yeah because a really important part of this book is that Nora has the ability to imitate anyone. She can hear a voice once and be able to replicate that voice. Exact tone, exact language used, everything. And so in the middle part of the book you're exploring how and why she has that ability. This was a hard book for me to rate because I really enjoyed the story of it and I enjoyed so many aspects of it. I really enjoyed the supernatural aspects, the mystery, the thriller, the characters. The thing that wasn't for me I think was the writing style and that's not to say it was bad writing by any means. There was just something about the tone that wasn't meshing with me in that moment. I don't know if I picked it up and read it at a different time in my life. It would have gone better. It just wasn't fitting my vibe at that time. But that's not to say it wasn't good and I wouldn't recommend it. I think if you like like paranormal stories, if you like mysteries and thrillers with a bit of horror as well, then you should check this out. If you like a nice atmospheric setting as well, I think this really delivers on that. The hotel in Birmingham is a really posh hotel, really luscious descriptions. I love stories where the characters are stuck all in one house. I think it's a really exciting way to build tension between people, which brings us on to the next book I read, which was The Grief House by Rebecca Thorne, another book recommended to me by Mr B's Emporium. I rated this 3.75 stars. This is another book which takes place in one location during a storm. Our main character, Blue, is grieving the death of her mother. So she goes off to a grief resort, which takes place in this house run by an older couple to kind of partake in group therapy with other people who are grieving loved ones. However, pretty much right off the bat, once Blue gets there, something's not quite right. There is a quite a big major part of this book, which I don't want to spoil here because I didn't know going into it and I think it's quite fun to go in not knowing that part of the book. But throughout the book we're getting primarily Blue's perspective at the grief resort as well we're getting her perspective from when she was a young child and her relationship with her mother throughout the years up until her death and then as well we're getting the perspective of a character who we don't quite know. In those chapters you're seeing glimpses of like connections to other parts of the story but you don't know quite how it all fits together which I thought was really well done and then you're also getting chapters from the perspective of the woman who runs the grief resort with her husband. Those were my favourite chapters. She was the most unique narrative voice out of all of those four and a really interesting inclusion because throughout you don't know whether you should be trusting this couple or not who are running the grief resort. I really enjoyed this book 
in terms of the way it was written. I liked how the mystery unfolded. I liked all the different perspectives. I liked how the author gradually showed us Blue's relationship with her mother, how that has affected her as an adult woman now, an adult woman who is grieving her mother's death as well. The thing that knocked it down for me in terms of enjoyment was the resolution at the end of the story. I think the first two thirds of the book, I was so enraptured with it. The last third kind of lost me a bit. I felt like rather than it being a like release of all the tension that was built up in the first two acts, it was more of a deflation. And I didn't love the reveal of the mystery at the end. I really haven't said what the mystery is. The mystery throughout is kind of, I can't, I don't think I can without giving away a really big spoiler that happens in the first act. So I'm not going to. The next book I read, which I also read for the Mr. B's video, is The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward. And this was my favourite book they recommended to me. I loved this so much. I gave this 4.75 stars. It was so close to a five star for me and I only didn't give it five star because towards the end of the book some things got a little bit, uh, only a little bit messy for me in terms of like following along with the narrative. There were some points where I had to go back to reread a page because I was confused about whose perspective I was with. If you've read this you might understand why. This is about a young girl who has gone missing years ago and is in the perspective of the man who kidnapped her, the man's cat, who's called Olivia, Lauren, the little girl, as well as Lauren's now adult sister who is determined to find out what happened to her all those years ago. So we have all these perspectives and throughout the book you gradually learn what happened on the day Lauren went missing. You learn more about Ted's relationship with his mother who is now dead, how his childhood was, as well as Lauren's history being kept in this house. This is a really hard book to explain to someone who hasn't read it without like completely giving away the whole story, but it's basically just a really interesting way of writing a thriller. There are points throughout where you're kind of getting told the same event that happened, but through a different character's perspective so like Ted will you'll be in Ted's perspective living a moment and then a couple chapters later Olivia will mention that moment moment Olivia has cat and it will be from her perspective and it will look entirely different from that perspective. This was just so immersive, so engaging. It took me a few chapters to get into it I would say but once I was in I literally couldn't put it down. I sat on the couch and just didn't speak to Alex until I finished it basically. I loved it so so much and I would definitely reread this again. All the characters are so well written and their voices are so unique. It was just a, a reading experience that I don't think I'll be forgetting for a long time. Next up I read How to End a Love Story by Yuling Kwan. This was the book that I was talking about at the beginning of the video that I was so hyped for because I love Yuling Kwang's short films that she's uploaded on YouTube. I just think she's really great and I was really excited to read her first novel and it just, I think maybe I overhyped it in my head. I had too high expectations, which is a really dangerous trap to fall into, but it just didn't live up to it for me. That's not to say it was badly written. Yulin Quang's amazing, like she is great at writing. But for me, it's just not the kind of romance I like to read. The setup for this story is we have Helen, whose sister died when she was a teenager. Her sister struggled with depression and ran out in front of a car one night whilst high. And the driver of that car was Grant, who was in Helen's year at school. So Grant essentially killed Helen's sister when, but really Helen had killed herself. They had to go through a trial and everything. It was decided that Helen's sister had killed herself and so Grant didn't go to prison, but obviously it was a very stressful, horrible time and Helen's family does not like Grant because he was driving the car that killed 
their child. So that is right at the start of the book and then the majority of the book takes place present day which is like mm, 10 or 15 years later. Helen is a really successful writer for young adult fiction and Grant is a really successful TV writer and Helen's books are being adapted into a TV show but when she gets to the writing room she finds out that Grant is one of the writers on the show. We have Helen hating Grant and then we have to have them work through the trauma of their past together and then we have them eventually fall for each other but then we also have Helen's family finding out about Grant and hating him. This was just like heavy heavy angst fan fiction level angst which kind of makes sense because I know that Yuling Quang used to write fan fiction and I love fan fiction myself but I tend to go for not as angsty fan fictions. I mean I should have known because I knew the description for this book going in so I should have been prepared for that. I just don't think I realised how angsty it was going to be. The subject matter that Yuling decided to, to write about and to base their relationship on is so so complex and dark that I just found it really hard to believe their relationship at any point during it. I didn't really feel the chemistry between the two characters and I really just felt the whole time like there's no way they would be able to spend any time together in the same room without having this really heavy past hanging over them. No matter how much they're able to work through it, I just don't know if they would ever initially feel an attraction towards each other. I just find that really hard to believe. So yeah, that was my thoughts on how to end a love story. It just, I know some people really love angst like that, but I just, I thought it was a bit depressing and I don't, I don't really want to read romances that are that depressing, you know? Especially from the get-go, it was like, quite a lot. It was quite a lot. Then I read The Reappearance of Rachel Price by Holly Jackson. I'm a big fan of Good Girl Guide to Murder series. Didn't love her book that came out after that so much. Can't remember what it's called now. This book for me was kind of the same. I did enjoy it while I was reading it, but I just think compared to Good Girl's Guide to Murder, it's just not as strong. This book follows our main character called Belle whose mother disappeared when she was just a baby and when she disappeared Belle was the only witness to the disappearance so she's the only one who could have told the police what happened to her mother but because she was a baby she can't remember anything. Now Belle is 18 living with her dad. A documentary is being filmed about the disappearance of Rachel Price which Belle isn't loving that's happening but she's doing it. But during the filming of this documentary one day Rachel Price shows back up and so the rest of the book is Belle trying to figure out who her mum is, if her mum's story about what happened to her is true where she's been all these years. Belle doesn't believe what her mum is telling her is the truth and so Belle works alongside one of the crew on the documentary to find out what exactly happened to Rachel Price and why she's lying about it. The things I really enjoyed about this book was Belle's relationship with the guy on the camera crew who I can't quite remember the name of now. He dresses kind of like a Harry Styles figure. He's very much described as looking like Harry Styles but kind of a more nerdy version I guess. They have a developing attraction to each other and I thought he was really sweet and I really liked their relationship as Belle doesn't have any friends friends except she's very close to her cousin but apart from that Belle has no one and has closed herself off from people. Their relationship was really nice because he got Belle to trust someone other than her dad and her cousin. I did find it very compelling to read like I was turning the page constantly just trying to figure out what had happened. Where it fell flat for me was again the climax of it. For one what actually happened. I like it kind of but then a part of me is kind of like, it's a bit far-fetched. But uh, putting that aside, what then happens after that, it, there's this really action-packed climax. Something happens that is like kind of similar to what happened in the third Good Girl's Guide to Murder book in terms of like 
character decisions and like a morally grey decision is made and everything. It felt a bit too similar to that book for me, what was happening, and I didn't really 100% love that aspect of the third Good Girls Guide to Murder. So I think that's where it kind of lost it for me. The next two books I read were the second and third book in the Cyrus Haven detective thriller series. The second one is When She Was Good and the third one is Lying Beside You. I read Good Girl Bad Girl last month and I loved it so I wanted to get up to date on the whole series and these are just really fun quick read detective thrillers set in Nottingham and following psychologist Cyrus Haven and his relationship with a girl called Evie who's had a really troubling past and mysterious upbringing. No one really knows where she's from or what she's been through. In the second book you learn a lot more about what she's been through. This was maybe possibly my favourite book in the series because I love the character of Evie so much and her story is the main part of this. And then in the third book we focus more on Cyrus and Evie's relationship as well as Cyrus's relationship with his brother who he has a troubling relationship with because his brother is I think he's schizophrenic and he murdered all of Cyrus's family when they were younger. It's not really a spoiler because you find that out in the first book like pretty immediately. I rated this four stars and this 3.5 stars so this was kind of the weakest in the series for me so far but still really enjoyable. It just took me a lot longer to get through it and I think this is maybe where my reading rut started to kick in. It just kind of was flagging a bit. I was up in Scotland this month too so there was just a lot going on but I do really like this series and the fourth book is coming out in June I think so I'm very excited for that. The best thing about them is definitely the characters specifically Cyrus and Evie but they have a really fun extended cast of characters too such as Cyrus's brother Elias. Um, Cyrus also has a friend in the police who is really good and then in this book there's a couple of new characters that have been introduced who I'm hoping stick around in the next book too. If you like a detective thriller I just these ones are good. The next book I read was A Fate Inked in Blood by Danielle L. Jensen. I've been seeing this absolutely everywhere like in every bookshop I go into it's just been really hyped up for me but I only gave this 2.5 stars. It was really difficult for me to get through this one. It took me a week to get through 30% of it which like I'm not the fastest reader in the world at all but that is slow for me. This book basically follows our main character called Freya who is a fishwife in this kind of nowhere village and one day she gets wrapped up in this whole big mess where she's revealed to be a daughter of one of the gods, Kjeln I think the name is. The king finds out that she's a daughter of Kjeln and this is part of a greater prophecy that he has heard that with her by his side he'll be able to take over the country basically and control everyone. Freya is forced to marry him, his name's Snorri, while she is basically falling for his son What's his name? Bjorn. I think his name is Bjorn. I'm finding it really difficult to actually describe to you what happens because I know lots of things happen in this book. I just found it quite boring. I, I was trying to figure out why it was taking me so long to get through it and I think the issue for me was that we were thrown into the action so quickly that there was no time to kind of catch your bearings and learn to like the characters enough to care about the world they're in and what they're doing. I like a book to take some time at the beginning to either focus on the world building so that they can then set up the characters within the world or focus on the character building so that we can then learn about the greater world that they live in. But I think this author was trying to do it all at the beginning. She was trying to like make us like the characters but make us understand the world and all the politics and all the magic and who all these gods are and what's going on all too much at the start that it just was like a bit dizzying but at the same time I also found the writing a bit cringe as well like the dialogue between the characters was too cringy for me and I have quite a high cringe factor like I can handle a lot um but it was just too much and also <laughs> I just with all the things that were going on around these characters I just could not buy that our main character had the time or energy to be so horny for this Bjorn guy. 
it didn't make sense to me in my head and it was actually kind of annoying every time she just started thinking about how much she wanted to jump him I was just like you're literally about to be stabbed can you please like get your head in the game so yeah I didn't love this book second half of the book I did pick up but not enough for me to rate it any higher than 2.5 and also I'm definitely not going to continue with this series I don't think it's just not for me I want to read a good Viking fantasy though so if you have any suggestions for that please send them my way next book I read was a five star read finally I read Cersei by Madeline Miller again finally I actually listened to this on audiobook on the drive up to Scotland and the drive back down to Scotland <laughs> back down to Scotland back down to England I loved it I'm not really surprised because Song of Achilles is one of my favourite books. It was a five star for me. But I do remember when Cersei first came out. I think maybe I got it on Kindle or something and I tried to read it initially when it came out and I just couldn't get into it. But I think that it was just catching me at the wrong time. That was when I was kind of like in a big reading rut. So that was on me. But Cersei basically follows the character of Cersei from Greek mythology who is the daughter of... Helios I think his name is, the son basically and tells you about who she was, what she got up to and who she met along the way and why she's cool. She's a really cool character, she's basically a witch who was banished to the island of Ayaya. That happens about a quarter of the way through I think. I also don't think it's really a spoiler to say that, one because it happens a quarter of the way through so it's quite early and also because that's like spoiling something from thousands of years ago. It's no secret. Madeline Miller just has a really poetic, lyrical way of writing, not in a pretentious way, and people might disagree with that, but I think um, there's certain styles of writing that are really lyrical and poetic that are just such a slog to get through and so hard to read, and you feel like the writer is just writing that way because they want to use fancy words and they want to write in this lyrical prose just for the sake of it rather than actually trying to deliver something. That's what I think is pretentious writing, whereas Madeline Miller's lyrical writing in Song of Achilles and Circe is just quite beautiful and it kind of makes sense within the world to be written that way. She does love a simile though. Uh, there's like a simile every sentence I think which is really impressive but also kind of a lot sometimes but not enough for me to rate it down. <laughs> I still really enjoyed it and I think again like I said I think it makes sense for the style of book. If it wasn't a Greek retelling the style of writing would annoy me but because it is a Greek retelling it fits that vibe you know. It feels like you're eating the the figs and dates and ambrosia and stuff. And then finally the last book that I read this month was a arc that I got through NetGalley. So thank you so much NetGalley and the publisher of this book. This was Four Eids and a Funeral by Abida Jagirdar and Farida Abike Iamide. I've not read anything from either of these two authors before but I know of Farida. I really want to read a book she's come out with recently that I put on one of my recent TBRs where the sleeping girls lie i think it's called she's written a book called ace of spades i think which is supposed to be they're both young adult thrillers i think that are quite dark academia which sound good so i do really want to read more of that this one was joint written by these two authors though and it is a young adult romance between two characters called saeed and tiwa who used to be best friends when they were younger but fell out for a reason unknown to the reader and now are basically enemies. Said attends this fancy private boarding school and um, so doesn't have to see much of Tiwa anyway until he comes back for summer holidays and their local Islamic centre burns down and Tiwa wants Said, who's a really good artist, to help her convince their local government to rebuild the Islamic Centre by getting him to do this amazing mural. Said, who wants to get into art school, is like, hmm, I could actually do this mural and use it for my portfolio to get into art school. So it kind of works out for him. But because they're enemies having to work together, it's a bit tense. We've got this present day storyline going on not knowing why they've fallen out and then throughout the book we are seeing 
how their relationship began, how they became best friends, what happened in the fallout through chapters throughout which detail a particular Eid celebration. And there's also a funeral at the beginning of this book for a librarian teacher that both had a massive impact on both of their lives. And that's where the title comes in for Eid's and a funeral. I did really like the narrative structure of this book. I really liked particularly Tiwa's character and her drive to save the Islamic center whilst being a black Muslim and learning about how within the Muslim community, she and her family are kind of snubbed a bit in comparison to Saeed who is embraced simply because they're black Muslims. I thought that was a really interesting part of her character, seeing her deal with that. Again, the book fell for me towards the end when the climax and the main conflict of the book come to a head because I just felt that the cause of the conflict, when you find out the reason why these two characters fell out, it came out of complete nowhere to me. I did not see it coming, but not in a good way. And it didn't make much sense to me either. So it felt very, it felt very miscommunication trope, which I don't love that trope anyway. And it also just felt a bit unearned. And I also thought that the dialogue at points were a bit clunky. I don't know if it's because it's two authors writing in a book. Obviously, I don't know the process of how you go about writing a book with two authors, but at times it just felt, yeah, clunky is the only word I can think of to describe it. it just felt a bit like clunky. <laughs> God. So overall, this was a cute read with some really interesting plot points going on, but it was a little bit messy for me, I think. And that's that. That's all the books that I read in April. It was an up and down month and a lot of books that I struggled to describe. I actually, towards the end of the month, because of my rut, I actually like felt it trying to describe them to you there as well. I just kind of had lost interest and I feel like I lacked a lot of passion for the books in the second half, except for Cersei. Cersei was a real standout for me, but this month wasn't the best. So please, fingers crossed May is gonna be good. I'm starting off May with an absolute banger. Well, I'm not really actually. <laughs> I'm actually finishing off a book right now that I started in April, but I couldn't count in the April one. So that's what that's the first book of me, I guess. But the book I've got lined up after is one that I've been waiting for for a long time. It's not a new release, it's just one that I haven't read yet that's been on my TBR for ages and I just decided now's the time and I'm so excited. Now that I've decided I'm gonna read it. Shall I just tell you? I'm reading The Secret History. Ah! So excited. I can't wait. Wow. Dark Academia, babe. Anyway, I really hope that you have an amazing upcoming week and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>